So a few days ago on my channel, I posted a video all about the MIRI instrument on board the James Webb Space Telescope and had a chat with my colleague, Dr. Libby Jones, who's on the MIRI science team, all about what it was like commissioning JWST, controlling the telescope, and also what it was like to see the images for the first time, you know, like months ahead of the rest of the world. Now for that video, I edited down our chat to around about 10 minutes or so, but we actually chatted for more like 30. So here is our full chat, only lightly edited just to clean things up a little bit. So I'm an STFC Web Fellow. Um, I'm involved in research with a JWST and also as part of the commissioning team and planning early observations. So I've been involved with Web for about eight to 10 years now. It's been quite a while. Um, Wow. So that must have been a bit of relief when it launched and everything folded out, like eight, another eight to 10 years was all worth it. Yeah. So I've been working on Webb as soon as I finished my PhD when I moved to Baltimore, the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is the home of Webb and Hubble mission operations. And then moving back to the, the UK uh, to be at the UK Astronomy Technology Centre, where a lot of the MIRI instrument was built. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Christmas was quite stressful, um, I have to say. Uh, it definitely wasn't the chilled out, relaxed day I, I, I like to have. It was definitely watching scientists on TV and watching all my friends. It's like, oh, great, they're talking. And, and a, a very different day to what I think the family had planned. <laughs> nice. So you mentioned you're part of the MIRI instrument then. Can you just explain for people what the MIRI instrument is uh, on board JWST? Okay, so there's four instruments on JWST. Uh, the MIRI is the one that operates at the longest wavelength, so that operates from 5 to 28 microns. And it's an imager, uh, a spectrograph, uh, both an IFU spectrograph and a slit spectrograph, and also it has chronographs. It, it, it does everything. <laughs> it's a fantastic instrument, of, um, um, brilliantly engineered. Um, so, But it's your, you'll get your longer wavelength, like, so your cooler objects and peers, uh, through more dust than what you would do in the, the the other three instruments. Nice. You almost get like guaranteed time on Miri because you've you've sort of been there like fighting the fight for the past ten years, getting it uh, all sorted. Oh yeah. No, actually, I, I no I guaranteed time does come from Miri, but um, I've used all the instruments on web so far. So I think I've used about twelve or already uh, in the first I think couple of months. I think I've used twelve of the seventeen modes of JWST observing which is quite a lot to get your head around because it's all different observations I'm getting. And I get very excited about this every month or so when <laughs> something new comes down. I bet. So with all these 12 different modes of observing, what science questions are you trying to answer specifically? I'm looking at the beginning and end of a star's life. So I'm looking at how stars are born in nearby galaxies and how stars die. So I'm looking at supernova 1987A for one for instance and with that we've thrown basically all the instruments we can get at at it so both the imaging and spectrograph with MIRI uh the near cam IFU spectrograph and then we're planning follow-up observations uh, in the next cycle so we can get time series data again so yeah that that's three three, three observing modes there right there and it, that's great to see the end of a star's life in exquisite resolution yeah and time series as well that, that's almost like watching it evolve in front of your very eyes yeah, so it's it's really exciting because it's currently going through a, a shock. So everything is changing and it, it's a continuously involving object. So to see uh, the death of a star and potentially the formation of a neutron star or black hole in real time, that's what we hope to get to eventually, uh, is exciting. But everything, yeah, it continuously changes. So we have to be on our toes with this, with this observation and with our planning of the observations for it as well. This must be such a steep learning curve, like figuring out what JWST can do. Because what is it about JWST that allows you specifically to study, for example, like 1987A? Oh, so something like this, it's having that high resolution view in the mid infrared, um, both with the imager and the spectrograph. So having spectra at every single point in, in the imager, because uh, you have it. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a pretty famous image. There's um, a central core, which is the ejector, which is actually the, the material produced by the supernova itself. And then there's a ring surrounding it of a previous history of material that the, the star before it exploded lost. And it's that interaction. So it's a really, really high dynamic range observation. You've got a really, really bright ring and this really faint ejector together. And so you need that sensitivity and spatial resolution together to really see what's going on in this object. And we've never been able to do that before. So getting those observations was very exciting and they're stunning. But spoilers, I can't show you what they are yet. <laughs> Damn it. I was hoping for a sneak peek. <laughs> but you've had this for a while, right? That you've seen images of JWST and not been able to tell them about to anybody because you were on the commissioning side of things as well. Was it just for Miri or was it for a lot of the instruments? And, and what was that like, like 
you know, everyone else was in the dark. We were all wondering what was going on. And you had this sort of like inside look into, you know, the first images from JWST. Yeah. So I was on console for Miri um, and we were supporting that in two of us were on shift at some point and we were on there 24 hours a day. So we worked some very odd hours. Yeah. Um, and so luckily I was there and only started being um, on console at the real business end when the images start to be taken. Some of my colleagues were there right from the start, watching just the instruments cool down and shutter movements and all sorts of things like that. And so that was quite a long process of keeping very detailed track of just minute changes of temperature. But for me, it was that we had already taken the first uh, telescope alignment images and then getting the first movie data. I was there a week or so after that. So it was all systems go. It was the first time we we're using very different modes, seeing would they work. It was very exciting just to be there and then getting sneak peeks of the data because we could, we had access to this. And so we were downloading and while we were on shift, uh, we were processing the data on on the fly just to see what we were getting. Was it working? Did we have what what had come back from the telescope? Because during commissioning, we had complete contact um, for most most of the day with the deep space network and be able to download things from um, JWST, which won't be the case as the mission continues. It's only certain hours of the day. Um, so it really was just a case of keep refreshing the archive to see, oh, have we got our data yet? And, and let's see what it is. And that could have been any of the different observing modes. So there's a plan, there's a long range plan. Um, and so you're looking at that and then seeing, oh, is JWST still on that plan? Um, are we doing anything today? Have we got any movie activities? And then you could hear other people in the room. So then the NERSVEC team were in there, the NERCAM team were in there, all the science operations were in the same room. And so you could, when anything exciting happened or something new happened, you could feel the atmosphere in the room change. And it was really great with people just really engaged with what was happening in everyone's observations. Did you get any sneak peeks of their data as well? Or was it all sort of like, no, you can't see my data yet? <laughs> no, you, you got all sneak peeks. Oh, you basically so got a, a full idea of what was going on. Um, and there was daily briefings, so you knew what was happening with each of the instruments. It was definitely all systems go and lots of hard work with people analysing the data as data was being taken. It, it was uh, quite an intense period and I think very well done by all the commissioning teams to get so much done in such a short space of time. Yeah, I can imagine it was so stressful. Do you remember like, did, was it like literally you arrived there on your first day and you got to see an image for the first time and obviously you'd already seen the alignment image so you had some idea but do you remember seeing that first image and what it was of? I don't think I remember my first image I saw what I remember is my very first shift absolutely terrified something would go wrong and I would need to go <laughs> through all the the safe modes and plans but we'd, we'd practice this for a very long time but you mm. needed to have an answer within I think 30 15 to 30 minutes of if something had gone wrong with the instruments and so if you, your first shift and you've not been there for a while uh, I was just like please everything worked fine and yeah luckily for me it, w it was all quite smooth sailing um <laughs> so uh, yeah I don't remember the very first real image I saw um I, I know a bit later on we're looking at um the hourglass nebula which was a planetary mm -hmm. nebula which was just a serendipitous observation in one of the filters and that was just like wow this is beautiful and then like trying to make quite make some quick three clear images and just just have a little bit of an excitement of oh, look what we're seeing now um, and what are we doing and yeah it, that was um some fantastic times and then everyone was in working in the library otherwise and just basically showing the data each other going oh look at this oh look what we've got oh, oh that's a bit weird yeah that must have been so cool like how far in advance of like the rest of us seeing that was that I think this was June June <laughs> yes yeah, so, so June uh June July was when commissioning was all systems go all the way to um having the first so none of the ancient modes have been fully commissioned at that stage mm -hmm. and then yeah, we were there and it's like, oh, look, one of them's been fully commissioned. This and this particular mode has been released. And then it got quite exciting. And then as our modes and like the hectic days of, of our various different stages, get like the imager was commissioned first and then the, the spectrographs, it was a lot of hard work, but also making sure we celebrated the successes because it was um, a very short turnaround. I think it was weeks before we got our first fully commissioned mode from our first very first MIRI observation so that if you think about the turning road and the analysis and checking what you were doing um pretty stunning but also lots of preparation by a fantastic team I think that's fantastic just having so many people in from all the world collaborating together to do something in such a short amount of time um I think that also just the humans involved I can't get over just how wonderful everyone is who's been involved in this which like yeah the engineers the technology like the mission control people 
the full range of everyone, the, the cleaning staff, just everyone is in all part of trying to get everything to work successfully. And it was really nice to be part of that. And I don't I think, think I'll forget it. I think I was just thrilled to just be part of the mission in some way and just thrilled to be there. That everyone's so grateful, and just happy. <laughs> yeah, makes a really good yeah. atmosphere. And then just the reception. I really am surprised about how well received it's been. I knew it was going to, I thought people were going to get excited. I thought, I thought they would have been a bit more chilled out by now. Like, maybe it's cool, but I yeah. wasn't expecting like, like, especially given the, like, the long launch to data. Mm. Um, yeah, anyway. I've I've had a blast and I'm continuing to have lots of blasts. I'm just science, <laughs> <Yay>. sciencing it. <laughs> Do you, was there any particular like standout moments from that time that you think, oh, I can remember that forever? Uh, yeah, there were there were two. Um, I think one of them was um, it was a couple of days before before things go into the schedule. Um, you coordinate with the schedule controllers and make sure all the observations are exactly how you want them. And one I remember, I was on shift and everyone was panicking a bit because we're going to observe the first transit spectroscopy with Miri. Mm. Um, so that was an exciting time and just lots of activity ongoing um, with what was, what was happening. Um, and so making sure we got that all planned. And then it happened to be that my next shift was actually when those observations were taking place. Um, so I was on console and then we got the data uh, and it because it's quite a short observation we need to make sure that oh no have we got the transit in the middle of the peak have we got the beginning and end because there was there was some delays with some of the previous observations so that was like oh no have we got it and then it turned out when we downloaded the data yes we did not only have we got it but you could see this transit almost in the raw pipeline produced data wow. without any very little processing and we're just like wow this is so much better than what we've done before mm -hmm. so yeah, that was a, an absolutely fantastic couple of shifts and it was just like wow we've done this for the first time this is great like mass panic with like major reward <laughs> it, i wouldn't say mass panic it was i would have been panicking i'm not good in these high stress situations uh, no, no it's just like you want to make sure you get the transit in, in its optimal point right if you're going to observe you might as well try but yeah with all these other things and knock-on effects it's done a day in advance um, you, you want to make sure it happens. And so actually everyone was actually very calm and collected. It was possibly the least panicky environment I've been in, which is um, quite sure, surreal. And I guess the other really memorable shift was I turned up and it was, a, I started at, I think, 5 a.m. And I was told, oh, well, you're going to be controlling the telescope today. Um, so <laughs> um, that was a, a bit uh, unexpected at the start. So we were changing... Um, we're uploading some commands to change the speed of a filter wheel. And it was just like, yep, yeah, now you're in charge of the telescope. And so making sure all the commands were going up and the script had mostly been in place, but you had to make sure the command was executed one at a time and each stage was painstakingly done. And you saw everything being typed real time to the telescope and going, yes, it was good to go or no wait and make sure that um, Miri was doing its thing. So they're the two really memorable all systems go shifts uh, yeah. that I was on. I still, I, I've controlled telescopes oh, on the ground, obviously not, but I've controlled telescopes before. And I know that controlling a telescope means sequence of commands, like on a computer. But in my head, when you said that, I still pictured like this giant joystick that you were just there, like, I'm controlling the telescope right now. But it, it's not like that at all. Can you sort of describe to people sort of what controlling the telescope entails in terms of like what everything looks like in front of you? Like, is it in a big like mission control, like like swanky sort of like you know huge room like you see in the films and stuff oh yeah it was definitely a huge room um so i had as a personal i had four massive monitors um with all the screens you can imagine so th think of the biggest monitor you can imagine then four of them in, in um sort of a console thing then a headset um with all where you're talking in your you, you've got your cheat sheet to talk properly on the headset like five by five or loud and clear um, rather than saying loud and clear and making sure talking to mom and the mission operation control manager. Um, so that's a separate thing. And then you also have your laptop with all the observations coming up. So, so you've got your four massive screens and your laptop. You've got all the data. So where web is pointing, the temperatures, the, the different movements. There's lots and lots of information in screens that you can see what's happening. You can see like the, the, the counts going up on your integrations that you're observing. And then, yeah, you have other screens that just show you the commands that are being uploaded to the telescope. So that's what you have in front of you, just as standard. And then also then these, these big screens in the top that show the timeline. So what's coming up next, where they're observing, what's happening. And then there's also a screen that's a, an animation of where web is pointing. 
So you can actually see if it's web slewing across the sky, you can see it like slewing across the stars in this <laughs> this sort of animated um, version of web as well. So it's possibly as, as technologically advanced as you can imagine. Um, all and then a cute world. little cartoon. <laughs> And yeah. a cute little cartoon. But to be honest, the cute little cartoon is probably really reassuring, isn't it? Because it almost helps you visualize like the sort of like the grandeur of what you're actually doing, I guess. Yeah, it, it really does. And it's also really helpful. Like, are you pointing at the patch of sky that you really wanted to? Because you don't know that until otherwise the observation is are taken. But this little nice little cartoon animation showing it in fact, and it's not really, it's pretty high precision, showing exactly when the sky is pointing, um, more or less, is very handy to make sure oh no we are in the right place we are getting the very beautiful uh, thing that's happening because there were some weird shifts when we're taking the early science observations and that was while everything else we knew we knew what was being taken those early release science so that was now the the, the big five so that yeah the big them. five the southern <laughs> ring nebula the deep mm-hmm. field all of that was being taken while i was on some shifts but they were just blacked out. And so I, even now, I don't know which ones I was on shift for when some of this data was being taken. Um, it's, oh, I don't wow. know which so they, ones they were. They decided those targets so far in advance that they knew by the time they were taken. Because I think in my head, I thought they took a load and went, they're the best, let's put those out. But they'd already decided way ahead of time, so much so that you, they were like redacted almost for you guys. Oh, yeah, they were definitely redacted. So um, so all you could see was, um, so if Miri was observing, it was Miri ERO mm-hmm. 5 or whatever. That's all you knew. And so one at one point, the shift coordinator wanted to know, is this doing what it's meant to be doing? And I was like, I can't tell you. I don't know what's in this. Um, the numbers are going up. I'm assuming it's doing the right thing. So, yeah, even at that stage, even people who were working on console at the time had no idea what the observations were. And so it was a surprise to me on the, the data release, the very first data release day, what these actually were. Hmm. I knew amazing. people had been working on it and I knew that they were stunning, but I had no idea what they actually were. That's incredible to think that even the science teams were just as in the dark as, as the rest of us. So, yeah, I mean, do you was- have a favourite image and it, it could be one of the big five, I guess. I don't know. But do you have a favorite image that you've seen so far from JBST? I think you've seen a lot more than most of us. Um, so did, did any of them stand out either scientifically or just because it's just really pretty? <laughs> I am continuously overwhelmed about how brilliant all the images are. I, I'm just geeking out. Every time I see something, I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. Or um, So yeah, I'm I don't think I have a favourite. I think whatever the latest one I've seen is is currently my favourite. So like Jupiter. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that yeah, one Jupiter they released the other day. Oh, it was so cool. Just to see the aurora on Jupiter and just the detail. I mean, wow. Yeah, like me? again, it was like in 3D again, wasn't it? Because like the depths you were seeing into the clouds. Oh, it was so cool. Just that high resolution view. And I know we've seen Jupiter other wavelengths at high resolution, just but how complementary it is to each other. And what really, over, I think, stuns me about Webb is that you can see Jupiter in its absolutely stunning glory, but you can also see some of the most distant light in the universe ever with the one telescope. I mean, what? Yeah, I just... so it's crazy that it can go from that faint to that bright, but didn't it even pick out like some faint galaxies in the background of the Jupiter image as well? Yes. <laughs> it's just like it can't just do both. It could do both at once. <laughs> like, what? did you expect I... that, that it would be able to do that? I knew the dynamic range was going to be very good, basically, due to the, the observations I had planned. I wasn't, I don't think I was fully prepared for what that actually meant when I saw the data. Mm-hmm. So, some of the first data I saw was in the Majonic Cloud, which is a region I've worked on for a very long time. And there's a lot of comparison images to the Spitz observations. And I was a member of that team who, uh, took the spits observations. So just seeing some of my a region of the sky, which I thought I knew very well, but then in high resolution and depth and just seeing all these clouds and galaxies and stars that I just didn't exist before. And I know how well the spits of data was uh, and how good that was. And it was like, wow. And I think that took me, I think a couple of days to process about, oh, this thing is fantastic. Yeah. beyond we've been saying it's going to be fantastic for a while but it's significantly better than what we were expecting or what I, I had in my mind anyway the question now is once now you've got all these images that you've applied for and everything like what now because obviously we know that the images come down off the telescope as sort of their raw format and obviously I guess it's going to be a lot of processing and good science takes time and all that but what's sort of the plan going forward well we submitted a paper yesterday 
um, <laughs> on, on on one of our very very beautiful data sets. So I think that's going to be a nice. Uh, I think that may be everyone's favorite image for a day um, for JWST. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to when that actually we get the referee report back and actually have that published because that's not we've not put that on archive yet or anywhere. It's basically we've kept it to ourselves. Uh, I think that's about the first proper science paper we've written so far as a team. I think there's a few there's drafts now coming out that we're we're in the process of and writing up some calibration and some of the actual nuances of science that I think various different science teams need and then I, th- I don't know I'm trying to probably want to publish about a paper a week I don't think I'll be able to <laughs> write enough science to keep up with it, it there's, I've got so much stunning data and it's I'm like a kid in a candy store playing with it and I want to work on it all at once and then okay I've got a new shiny laptop to try and process things a bit faster I just I'm making beautiful images all the time and beautiful spectra and looking at uh, new lines that we've not seen before and it's just like Wow. And then now it's a case of, I think I'm having to learn about five PhDs at once to do science that has never been done before um, or in very different situations. So even though I've worked in the infrared for a very long time, um, we don't have the tools for some of this. It's like, oh, we didn't think this was possible. So the tools just don't exist to do the analysis. Um, so that's... Um, it's almost like that, relearning everything you thought you knew. That must be like so like humbling and exciting at the same time. Or just, yeah, or just how faint we're going. Um, so mm. I'm used to looking at, sort of, I look at a lot of evolved stars and then we cut off with what, what we previously did. And now I'm going about eight or nine, ten magnitudes below what I'm used to seeing. And I'm just like, what are these bumps? What what are these? And it's like, is this the main sequence? Turn on? What, what, what? A main what sequence turn on rather than a main sequence turn off. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're seeing all these things and I'm just like I've never seen this before how would you especially not in the mid-infrared or yeah it's 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 learning like how do we deal with this data now that that's I think the next stage after we made these very first look and and quick data it's Mm. oh wow this can tell us a lot more than what we thought it can how do we do this analysis yeah like questions that you never thought you'd even be able to ask you know, you can do it, I guess, now. What does the processing of the images actually entail, though, for people who don't necessarily understand sort of, you know, when the data comes off raw to actually doing science with it? Obviously, you're probably, like you say, invented tools as you go because no one's ever done this processing before. Um, but what does it entail? So the first thing we do is go to the the Space Telescope Archive and just download the the very final data products and sets that um, JWST produces. So they're in the term level three data. So your mosaics and then that gives you a quick look at your data is it pointed where you wanted it to point uh, is, is it looking good in, in the broader sense of the terms and, and then you look at it and you go well okay i've mosaic this region there's these patches that we could improve upon this oh there's a bit of striping we can get rid of that and so then you start to download the very early data and then tweak some of the pipeline tools and you do various different processing steps and then that takes a depending on what you ask it to do and how big your data set is, that can take quite a while to reprocess it. And as we're getting new calibration files and learning more about web as we go, um, we have to do this step quite a few times before it's even close to being science ready. Um, so there's various different optional steps you can pick and you, you sort of try and you see, does this look better? Does it look worse? Is this actually telling us the science we want? And then do some tweaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's quite an iterative process after you've had that first, oh, look, this is what we've got. This is amazing. And I don't think I've been disappointed by anything at all yet. It's just like, I think I've been just wowed. Um, and I just want to uh, get on my Slack channel and share it to the various teams I'm on. Um, I think is the very first thing I do with like, oh, look, look at this. And then we go, oh, yeah. And so as any scientist knows, you want to know how to improve upon it. And you do, and you see, keep asking more questions like that. So I think that's currently the stage we're at is, even though it's very early days, I think we can make, we keep processing and making things better before we really want to trust doing analysis on things um full and full analysis and writing everything up in what would be very confident to write as a submitted paper yeah <laughs> understanding these tweaks like we understand this this effect it looked like aliens moving from the sky but it wasn't it's something called a snowball effect uh, of cosmic rays you're just like oh what is this like these all different <laughs> detector effects that you're learning about for the, the first time um wow that some people will know about in the team but other not all of the team know and it's like oh especially as a, yeah as we're using so many different instruments and modes mm. no one is an expert on one of these so it's like what is this it must be fun sort of having to do all this processing 
on public data as well, because it is all public. And obviously, you know it best as the science team who've applied for this. But is there a sense of like, I have to do this before anybody else does? Um, I think it's this is the whole thing that we hadn't quite factored in is um, I wasn't expecting to see some of the science that we got maybe a few hours before and going, is this real? Is this a detector effect? And then suddenly seeing a very beautiful picture on Reddit that someone else has po- processed. <laughs> um, that that was a completely new one for me and not with the right science analysis or, or different. Um, I, I think, oh, very different than here's a gorgeous image to let's get some science out of this. Mm-hmm. So I guess, uh, yeah, that that was a whole new kettle of fish. I don't, I don't think anyone in the team quite expected. Um, but you get scooped but, by Reddit. <laughs> it, it was, yeah, that was an interesting day. It's just like, wow, have we really seen this? And then we were talking and, and consulting our various experts, or in some case, yeah, we're talking to each other, going, are we, are we confident? And then suddenly you just see this full picture with that on um, various social media, and like, oh, well, that's our data out then. <laughs> Oh gosh, that must be so, so strange. But I mean, yeah, like, I mean, you obviously want to be very careful in the actual interpretation of it, that obviously that's what you guys are doing behind the scenes while everyone just just drools over the gorgeous images. Well, yeah, at least um, it's, well, we've got two things, like gorgeous images, gorgeous spectra and good science. And so, okay, I'm glad the world is enjoying all the gorgeous images. I'm very much enjoying the wonderful science that's being produced and the new questions and just how it's changed our view in what... June, July, August, three months. <laughs> yeah, like saying redshift like 12 now or even 15 doesn't sound as foreign as it did like three months ago. I, and That's insane. Yeah, the fact that that's becoming commonplace now and just the, the change in the what we're seeing in these early galaxies and just, oh, we can get metallicities. Oh, um, I guess astronomer metallicities, basically not hydrogen or helium. Um, <laughs> it, it's just wonderful. It really is. And I, I really can't wait to see the full array of actual process mm journal accepted articles that have been fully calibrated I think that's my next moment of wonder to enjoy reading those and I don't think I'll have enough reading time to get through anywhere close to how many uh, JWST papers are going to come out in the next year well I think for now we're all happy to just drool at the images and wait very patiently for all those journal articles to come out hopefully very soon (laughs) a massive thank you again to dr libby jones for taking the time out of her day to chat to me if you want to see more videos like this check out some of the other chats i've had with my astrophysics colleagues which i've popped into a playlist and linked below for you thank you so much for being here chatting space with me and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss more content like this